what are you doing exercise wise or diet wise? Do you have a bit of stress in your life? Now, all of these things, uh, you know that you take that on board physically. Will it affect you? Well, probably in some ways. You might be putting on weight, losing weight. The stress might be uh, increasing your susceptibility to certain conditions. The big question is, though, how will it affect your kids and grandkids? Because there's a whole new level of research looking into this idea of epigenetics. The idea that these sorts of things and what our brain knows and understands can in fact be passed down through the generations. It's absolutely fascinating uh, research. Uh, Joining us now is Professor Anthony, or Tony Hannon. He's the head of our epigenetics lab at the Florey Institute of Neuroscience and Mental Health. Professor, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Simon. Can you explain exactly what epigenetics is? Yes, to explain epigenetics, I've got two analogies. So the first analogy uh, is in book form. So if you imagine every cell in your body with a copy of your genome and think of that as a little guidebook of about 20,000 words, each word being a gene. And so think about epigenetics as italics, bold, underline or different coloured highlighters. So that's whether each gene is turned on or off. The other analogy would be that the 20,000 genes would be 20,000 instruments in an orchestra and epigenetics is the musicians and together that forms a symphony of life. So either way, that's uh, a simple explanation of epigenetics. What do we know about how, uh, our, is it our brain that turns these on or who and how is that manipulated? Uh, so the epigenetics can occur in, in pretty much every cell in your body. So obviously the epigenetics in your brain is occurring at the level of molecules or cells, but it can also occur outside the brain. And so we know that some of it occurs via experience and your experience in different forms uh, reaches right down to the level of molecules and genes so that epigenetics, for example, is a chemical modification of a particular gene. So there's many different molecules involved and, in fact, many different cells involved. It's, it's quite a complex uh, process that can involve many different cells in your body. So let's talk about it in relation to diet and exercise in particular because we talk about obesity in particular being one of those generational problems. Is this a question of epigenetics? Yes, we've been exploring this area of transgenerational epigenetic inheritance. So I think we've known for a very long time that what a mother does before she's pregnant is going to impact on her baby and and her children later on. That's been well known. But we've been particularly interested in the other side, the idea that what a male does before conception can affect uh, his offspring, his children, via the sperm and evidence is accumulating for example in diet that what uh, a mother does before conception and and during pregnancy of course can affect her offspring in the long term via epigenetic mechanisms but also what a man does in terms of diet but also other factors like stress can affect the epigenetics in his sperm and therefore he can pass on factors that might increase risk and what I might call epigenopathy increased predisposition for disease via epigenetics or even resilience uh, and the idea that what a male does before conception can affect their offspring. So this is a very different way of looking at um, public health, in fact. It's not really all just uh, up to women to look after the health of their babies and offspring. It might be up to uh, men as well. Mm. So so what does that mean in reality, though? I mean, are we talking about the fact that you are then predisposed to, say, being obese if your mum or dad uh, perhaps had bad or uh, less than ideal diet and exercise patterns? Or does it mean that you're likely to have the same, develop the same patterns, therefore leading to obesity? Yes, it's never black and white. So anyone's predisposition to any disease or disorder is always a combination of genes and environment. So someone's 
genome, their genetics will always contribute to their risk. So this is not removing genetics or genes from the equation, but epigenetics is another layer. So it may be that because of something that uh, someone's father or mother did before conception, that, for example, they're more prone to become overweight or obese. But that doesn't mean that, in a sense, you're doomed from the womb. The idea is that always that a dietary intervention, an exercise intervention, or maybe uh, in worst case scenario, some people even for obesity have to resort to mm. other approaches as well. Uh, it doesn't mean that anything is 100% or irreversible. It just means that your predisposition may be higher than someone else because of what your parents did, or it might be lower than someone else um, because of positive lifestyle factors. So what, what is actually happening then? Are we actually changing the egg and the sperm that creates a new life in, in relation to uh, what you described as being what is switched on in relation to the DNA? Um, and can that be reversed once that combination is made? Yes, it's pretty clear. It's easier to study in males, obviously, because sperm are, are a population of cells that can be accessed not just in mice and rats that are studied in the lab, but also in humans. It's harder, obviously, uh, to study women's eggs in terms of <laughs> women don't generally want to donate them for, for research, but we know in women that what they do while they're pregnant also has uh, a major impact. So it's, it's becoming increasingly clear that these changes are occurring uh, in sperm due to some of these lifestyle factors like diet and stress. But the positive thing, again, is that epigenetics is potentially reversible. So it may be that these negative factors might be reversible if we can understand uh, what happens in these processes and how we might actually reverse them. But we don't know how to do that at the moment. No, we don't. And we don't really know. A lot more research needs to be done because we've done this research at the Flory using mice and we can show pretty clearly, for example, increased stress hormone in the father mice before conception changes the offspring in a way that increases anxiety, for example. Uh, so those results in mice are very clear. But to do the equivalent studies in humans are very long-term studies, obviously not just studying the sperm of men, but actually um, studying their children over long periods of time. So these studies need to be done, but they take a lot of money and they take a lot of time. And so we're at the point where we need to gather a lot more data from human studies and, and more data, in fact, from uh, these studies in mice and rats, for example. You've mentioned stress, uh, Professor. Um, we're talking with Professor Tony Hannon from uh, the Flory Institute. Um, you've talked about stress, but let's talk a bit more about that. Marie on our text line uh, mentions very specifically, she says, how about those kids born to parents exposed to the war, for example, the stress experienced then and being passed down to the offspring? And we know that many uh, generations ago, well, in any generation, people are exposed to very, very terrible things. How is that impacting? Yeah, that's a great question. And some of the human data that's already there and has been published includes studies of Holocaust survivors and their children and grandchildren. And some of this evidence that this is occurring, including through the fathers, has come from those kind of studies where people were exposed, for example, uh, to the Holocaust, so very high levels of stress, and others are starting to do studies. In, for example, they're doing studies on survivors of Ground Zero, September 11, and people who were there and, and experienced that extreme stress. And for example, people who have experienced post-traumatic stress disorder through war, for example, returning soldiers and people like that. So there are many ongoing studies and people are known to be exposed to high levels of stress at a particular point in time and they can follow them over time and even start to follow their children over time. And it is becoming pretty clear that uh, stress can have an effect just not on the exposed generation but potentially on their children as well. How many generations are we talking about? Is it just Great the next question. generation? The Holocaust, yeah, the Holocaust work suggests it at least goes to grandchildren. Uh, it's an interesting point in that it may eventually um, dilute with each generation so it may not have the same intensity as it goes through. And there's interesting differences too, we think, you know, going from a father 
to a daughter to grandchildren may be different from going from a father to a son to grandchildren. So depending which, what we call the germline, which, which side it goes through from children to grandchildren, there may be a different biological effect. Tony, when it comes to the positive aspects, I guess we would be keen to see those passed down. But the ones you're talking about now are ones that possibly we'd like to reverse. Where are we at with perhaps determining whether we can reverse those generational effects of epigenetics? We think some of these are reversible. One of the best studies uh, to be done was done in obese men where they collected sperm samples from obese versus control men and they measured the epigenetics and indeed showed that the obese men had altered epigenetics. That was very clear which kind of matched the work that had been done uh, in the mice previously. And then these particular men because they tried dietary and exercise interventions and that had failed. So a last resort for these obese men was surgery. So sometimes this surgery is done as a last resort uh, with obesity. And in response to the surgery, as their body weight started to return towards normal, their sperm epigenetics started to return towards normal as well. So that's indicating that if something that can be done to improve the health of the individual, for example, a, a male before he becomes a father, then these negative epigenetic factors might be reversible as well. There's so le less easy to measure, it, I guess, with something like stress though, isn't it? You're right, it's, a, it's challenging, but we know there are specific stress hormones that you can measure. So you can measure the circulating stress hormones people have. There are other ways you can quantify how people respond to stress. There are a, a whole range of different ways of quantifying people's stress levels. So it, it's not quite as easy as body weight and diet, but it, it can be done. So you can measure people's responses to stress and biological uh, measures such as stress hormone levels. We're, we're talking about things like diet, exercise and um, stress here, but what about things like talent on the sports field or musical prowess? Are those things that we would classify under the epigenetics banner? Uh, that's interesting in terms of talents and abilities and, and so on, which is very broad. And I think what you're coming down to then, if you were to call those traits whether it's a trait or a disorder, it's always genes and environment. And the environment uh, imposes its imprint on the genes via epigenetics. So someone's ability in that sense will always be a combination of their genetic uh, predisposition, which is usually a very wide range of possibilities, and then their environment or their lifestyle um, you know, from conception onwards, and some of this recent evidence suggests that maybe there'll be effects uh, preconception as well via the parents. That combination will dictate where someone's real potential arrives. But um, genetics is never um, 100% um, predictive, so that there's always room for environment, and that's the whole rationale for education and, and training and so on, that no one... Uh, no one has their fate determined entirely by their genetics. Fascinating. Uh, Professor, thank you for joining us to talk about this. Professor Anthony, or Tony Hannon, has been with us. He's the head of, our, of the Epigenetics Lab at the Flory Institute of Neuroscience and Mental Health.